Now entering Nerdist.com. Wrestling buddies want to be your buddies. Hey, buddy. Buddy. You got me mad now. This is the week, it is almost time, and space is the place, the party of the summer, the fight of the summer, the Donnybrook of the summer. Yes, SummerSlam is coming up this week, which makes this episode of the Slamcast the... Go home! That's your home! Are you too good for your home? It's the go-home slam cast, guys. But guess what? SummerSlam is in our backyard. It's in our damn home. Oh, man. That is such a pleasure. Yes, we are. It's a pleasure. Easy travel day. <laughs> we are in Los Angeles. What's up, everybody? Wherever you're listening, we know we have listeners all over the world, so we appreciate you as always. I'm Johnny LaQuasto. Follow us all on Twitter. I am at JQuasto, the man to my left. He's always vest for business. Find him on Twitter at the Walking Dale. He is Dale Rutledge. You know, we're spoiled, actually. This is like the sixth or seventh year now that SummerSlam has been right here at the Staples Center. So, I mean, I thought last year was the final one, but then they brought it back this yeah, year. Yeah, they did this, a little... I know Dale started a rumor. A little bonus. <laughs> well, this might be really the final one in LA, Yeah, yeah. Officially. Well, there was some kind of issue with, like, another thing there or something. I don't know, but I'm glad they're back, and I am excited to go. Brother! No doubt about that. <laughs> the man to my right, uh, Hulk was on the show last week. The man to my right. You can find him on Twitter at CRice17. He's the pride of Houston. He is none other than the Chuck Rice. He's a man. What's poppin', Daddy? I am so glad you decided to give me my theme music back this week. Because <laughs> we were getting tweets, Johnny. You saw them. What? People were mad. No, they weren't. People were mad. Dude, you're seeing things. You're reading into it. No, really no, no. Into it. <laughs> like, maybe one person referenced it and Chuck's like, oh, my people are mad. <laughs> they were mad, Johnny. Okay. Speaking hey. of he's a man, I wanted to say, uh, I learned this weekend that my grandpa, so my grandpa died before... I was around, okay. so I never got to meet him, but my brother was telling me this weekend that he used to sit in my grandpa's lap and watch wrestling together. Get out of here. That's awesome. Is that the cutest thing ever? So right? it runs in the family. It's in my blood. Yeah, right. and you didn't even know. Didn't even know. And, and speaking of being mad, we know someone that got mad this week. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, really? You're going you're gonna... <laughs> to... J-Lo. Let's, let's, just say that, let's just say that myself, Dale Rutledge, and Booker T are excellent pranksters. And that's all y'all okay. need to know. It's kind of easy to prank someone via text when you can't tell tone or you don't have to act. <laughs> like, if you were to try to pull a prank on me in person, I can see right through you, so it would have been easy. But the fact that you told me Booker was mad at me for something via text, I legit was nervous. <laughs> I, do, I do have to say, though, Johnny, you're, you're one of the more gullible people that I've uh, Oh, yeah, I believe everything. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're, I, you're I don't know gullible. if you would have been able to tell yep. in person, man. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a we big, still love you, Johnny. I'm a big, dumb St. Bernard. I believe pretty much <laughs> uh, everything. Is that why you have that jug around your neck all the time? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was wondering why. Exactly. I, I slobber a lot. <laughs> Now, that's, that's, so oh, go ahead, tell everyone the prank, Chuck. Go ahead. Well, it doesn't, the, the prank, it, it, it doesn't really matter that much. Let's just say that Johnny was a little butthurt about, you know, Twitter and Booker following him and all that kind of stuff. No, no, it wasn't. No, that wasn't <laughs> it. You told me that Booker was mad at me for something that I did at the pay-per-view when we were in Houston. And I was like, well, what did I do? I was working, and then I was on the thing, and I was like, cool, I was cool with everybody. The rumor was you were flirting with uh, oh, cinema. Oh, God. Though. That is a rumor. Yes, the stop. rumor, I mean... Rumor, truth, you know. Booker who knows. said so last week. Oh, you know, maybe. Booker said it. Cinema said it. Everybody on the R. Oh, Cinema didn't Ross say anything. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the hell out of Lana here. Lana got involved. Where'd she come from? Josh hey, Lana right can always get involved as far as I'm concerned. Hello. <laughs> so, yeah, great job. You, you pulled it off. But, but you know what? I, I, too, am very much looking forward to SummerSlam this weekend, Johnny. Tell us why. I get to, You know what? I get to take my cousin with me. Uh, she's, she's not a wrestling fan, but, mm -hmm. you know. Her, her mother is going through some rough times right now, battling cancer and all that. And I think that this would be a really cool distraction, you know, see, totally. go see like the live event, live aspect of wrestling that for so long, my family never understood my passion growing up. And they're all like, mm. wrestling's dumb. Well, she's really excited to come. So I'm excited to show it to her. It, there's nothing like a live event, especially <laughs> something like SummerSlam. Every, every SummerSlam, I try to take somebody new that has never seen wrestling. And every single time it 
they leave just exuberated. They're just yeah. like, that is the best thing I've ever seen. Like, seeing it live is what got me hooked. I, I liked it, you know, but I didn't become obsessed with it until I saw that live show because well, it's like nothing else. Well, dude, we've been lucky enough. We've had a lot of people tell us over the past six months, our show has gotten people back into wrestling. Yeah. Uh, sure, it's probably ruined their relationships, but <laughs> that was the network, not us. <laughs> We've gotten hey, back yo. into wrestling at least, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> well, one of those is actually one of our uh, one of our very good listeners, uh, Connor. Yeah, uh, what up, you know, Connor? His, his girlfriend, she has gotten into wrestling more from listening to our show, and they watch and, it together. That's they, good relationship that's stuff. Good. Look and, at that. And, and a shout out to her. You know, we know that both of you are going through a little bit of a tough time this past week, but. You're in our thoughts and prayers, guys. No doubt about it, man. We uh, we appreciate you guys. The co-founder of Ruffigans.com with our boy James Kennedy. I learn new things about myself on there sometimes. Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> they, they find stuff on us. Talk I'm about like, where did you bi- un- unbury this from? I tried <laughs> to keep that hush-hush for years. It's like picture of Chuck from the prom. Like, how'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of, uh, it's it's great you're taking your cousin to SummerSlam, and, and obviously our man Tony uh, trying to get that the new wheelchair. We're helping him out with that. I actually found out something this week, and um, since Goldberg's on the show, he's very very active in the military. He's doing a lot of things with the military. I found out I'm actually uh, I'm t- doing my first military tour uh, to entertain the troops in October. I'm oh, that's going, awesome! Yeah, full, you're joining the military? A uh, hell no! They don't want me. <laughs> Trust where, are they, where are they sending you over to, Johnny? I'm going to be in Southeast Asia. I don't know the info yet, but Southeast Asia. And we were supposed to be going to Africa, but I don't see how that's possible right now. TBD. Yeah. yeah. Those, those poor freaking troops, man, they're supposed to send people to entertain them. <laughs> I know. So I'm just playing, Johnny. They will. Luckily, very there's much three enjoy other that. three other comics are on the tour with me, so you know. They'll nah, least... John. Listen, listen. <laughs> as much as I bust your balls, I've seen your live show, and it is funny. Your regular uh, Bob Hope over here. No, definitely not. But uh, I'm honored, though. I've, it's when I started comedy. It's one of my goals I always wanted to do, and so this tour is going to be really fun. And uh, 17 days in October, so I'm going to have to do like I'm going to have to record some messages and just mail them in, and then put them on the show or something. Have you ever gone out of the country? Uh, I've been to Europe once, uh, Italy, and then I went to uh, London this past October to oh, chase yeah. a girl. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. In, 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 Wait, in the words of the late, great Robin Williams, I, I went to see about a girl for a couple days because <laughs> I'm a dumbass. Hey, you know, you got to follow hey, your you heart. You got to go to London, though, so whatever. I did. I went to London for almost three days. People thought I was insane to fly 10 hours each way. And they're like, well, how long are you going for? Uh, um, two and a half days. Yeah. What? If we were on the East Coast, that might make sense. But from hey. L.A., that's far. Hey, listen, listen. Sometimes you just got to follow the heart, man. Yeah. Or chase that tail, whatever it is. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> or both. Best for business. <laughs> so, yeah. I cannot wait to do that. But um, anyways, let's get right to it. We have a, a jam-packed show. We have Goldberg. Yes. Coming up. Mm-hmm. But right now, we have a gentleman that, uh, well, hell, he's on a world tour. You can see him on the Mick Foley World Tour all across the country and actually the world. Too many accolades to mention. He is the hardcore legend, and he just received an award, I believe, yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, find him on Twitter at Real Mick Foley. He's Mick Foley. Hello, sir. Hey, man. How's it going? Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. No problem. Now, I know right now you are presently in the city of Pasadena, and you have a show coming up in a couple of hours. Uh, what are your thoughts so far? I know you're doing a lot of SoCal dates. Yeah, I yeah I am. Last year, as you know, I did the uh, the post SummerSlam show, and uh, I really you know I I got the feeling I wasn't going to be part of uh, you know the festivities for SummerSlam this year, and by the time I got that feeling, I already had booked like you know the the five days leading up to it. So I've got uh, yeah tonight in Pasadena, and then uh, Ontario, Brea, and two nights in Ventura, and then I'll I, I'll head home. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I have a great time. I, I love it out here. I'm looking at a big mountain. We're, we're raising money next few nights for uh, the, the little young girl's dream of raising a million dollars for uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And so we'll create some laughs and uh, some dollars for a good cause along the way. Well, we definitely have to get that link for you so we can uh, we can plug it on social media as well. I appreciate that. So have you ever done the Ice House before? Is this your first time? This is my first time, man. Uh, you know, I like it up north of uh, L.A. a little bit. You know, it's uh, I went, I did Stone Cold's podcast last night. And it was kind of such a relief, you know, to be leaving at like two in the morning and just you know flying by without any traffic. So uh, I enjoy it. I mean, I've, I've always liked Pasadena, and it's my first time performing it. Well, I can tell you this: there's no club like the Ice House. The acoustics. And and just the the reverb on the sound. There's nothing like it. It's going to be sold out. 
the crowd reaction is going to be phenomenal, so you're going to have an incredible night. It's, it's well, just I cool. believe that the acoustics are phenomenal and the crowd reaction will be great. I'm not sure if it's going to be sold out, though. But, <laughs> but I think we're going to come, we're really going to come close. And uh, a sound system is one of those things like a good referee in a wrestling match. Like You don't realize how important it is until you don't have it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then it can become a really difficult proposition. I like to kind of go up and down and modulation, and I whisper sometimes, and I, I go into 97 Mankind where I'll do a little bit of yelling. And uh, if you don't have that, then you end up yelling the whole show, and it kind of takes away from what you're trying to do. No doubt about that. Now tell us about the Santa Claus movie. I know you've been uh, – you went to the big Santa Claus conference, I believe, and I, I know you're filming something now, right? <laughs> no, we're done filming. Uh, we just had like a little – the first screening uh, we did it just rented a, a, a theater out and we did a screening for um, a crew and and uh, friends and family and it, man it was really rewarding he, you know my my son who's 11 who's pretty tough on most things that I do <laughs> wrestling wise <laughs> he's my harshest critic uh, he loved the movie and I love the fact that he's in it with me my daughter is 20 and she's like dad that's really good you know it's like you've got a lot of heart and depth to do it it's going to surprise a, a lot of people and so I'm, I'm thrilled about it and it looks like it's going to be out in theaters and uh, on dvd uh shortly right around thanksgiving this year wow that's awesome nick i'm, I'm dying to know what is a santa claus convention even like <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, every convention takes on its own unique atmosphere. Uh, you know, there are people who would run in fear from wrestling conventions. <laughs> That's uh, true. That's you know, true. people, you know, I mean, I just walk around like it's it's just par for the course. Like the wrestling conventions are the least strange places that I go. You know, like uh, the sci-fi cons and the comic cons where people, you know, with the horror movie things where people are dressed up like their favorite characters. And so at Santa conventions, uh, you know, you just have several hundred people who, you know, who, you know, really, in some cases, like, they live for that month or six weeks where they get to uh, por- portray that iconic figure. And so what the I Am Santa Claus's intention was to find out what these guys do with the rest of the year. And, it, you know, it, it varies from being really touching and funny to being a, a kind of um, sad uh, you know, to see how badly people want it, and then, then in some cases, don't can't have it uh, the way they'd like. Are there are any of those stories that stand out to you that are like funny that you can share with us? Uh well, you know, I remember when I was, but uh, um, <laughs> the very first Santa visit I have, and this is kind of it was really rewarding. You got a huge laugh from the audience, and, and you know, I kind of envisioned it as. We were editing the movie. I was like, I'm pretty sure people are going to really appreciate this. So the first kid who ever sits on my lap, he I said, what would you like, young man? You know, I got almost like a whisper when I'm saying, he goes, a ball. I go, I think Santa can arrange that. Is there anything else you'd like to find under your tree? He goes, another ball. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me you'd like to, and I realized I can't you know, like, Oh boy! Go there like round um, athletic spheres, and it got the the big pop. Is everybody knew exactly what was going through my mind and realized you cannot say that. <laughs> and then, and then you found out the kid was seventeen years old. And then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you got you know you have to be uh, careful. Like I, any of these sins, I, I said, no, no, don't even go there. I'm like if you have an attractive woman, don't ask her about the naughty list. You know, like. Just, just keep it clean when you're in the suit, and then, uh, you know, then you can. Uh, you, if you have an alter ego like a wrestler, you can be a little bit off color. That's amazing. Now, how many Santa visits? You mentioned that was like the thirty-first. Like, how many visits are we talking about? Well, the cool thing, and from I don't, I don't put in like lots of hours. Like, you know, it's not to me like a, a job. Like a guy who goes in and does ten hours. Hey, man, that's. Uh, that takes the patience of a saint. So for me, it's like I'm lining up gigs like that I want to do, you know, like two Christmas Eve visits. And uh, last year on, uh, on Christmas Day, I went to a, a housing project in Harlem and delivered toys to a, a family that you know, really didn't have the means to, you know, to provide them for the kids. And then, I'll, you know, I'll pick out a couple of charitable organizations. And, uh, you know, last year I sang a duet with uh, Nora Jones, uh, completely butchered it. 
<laughs> it was not intended to be a duet. I just walked up to the microphone and decided that <laughs> I needed to do that in my life. And, uh, and it turns out it was like four more stanzas of Silent Night than I actually knew. Oh. <laughs> oh, we're, we're all in the but same I love boat. it, man. You know, it's one of those things, you know, I mean, you can't explain it to someone, you know, and why you either love it or you don't, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's something I really I really look forward to. And also what's great about now the, the fact that you've been in stand-up for a while is you're touring all over the country, all over the world. You can spread the word about all these charitable causes to a live audience and – Right after you're done performing to a live audience, they're always much more willing to jump on board. Yeah, in this case, uh, this, this young lady, um, you know, she she came up with this million dollar dream to get a million followers to each donate a dollar wow. and uh, to reach a million dollars. That's not likely to happen. But I put a post out there today saying, like, in a Haley Joel Osment type of pay it forward way, uh, you know, the ability to inspire others and bring out the best in them so they might bring out the best in somebody else is something you can't put a price tag on. So we'll, we'll reasonably raise over $1,000 the next three nights, you know, selling uh, photos. And then I'll just kind of go up there. This is usually something you do during a show if you're selling afterwards, you know, and just say, hey, look, I'm doing this thing. Uh, we're trying to raise money, but there's no pressure at all on anyone to buy anything. I'll, uh, I'll, you know, take the photo for free. I'll sign your own item. But if you don't buy a photo, I'll just assume you hate children. So, <laughs> <laughs> like that nice. Little, just that little slight guilting. <laughs> that is the difference. Someone parting with ten dollars and and not parting with it. And so instead of getting you know two hundred dollars, you know you might end up you know with. Uh, Five or six hundred, and in the end, that makes a difference for a good cause. That's just great marketing, right there. <laughs> you know, Mick's been very active in trying to help one of our listeners. Even you know, like you, Mick, we see you so involved with different people. Uh, our our guy Tony, that's trying to get the wheelchair. He's been. Oh yeah, yeah. Now I I warned Tony. I said, Tony, I have to tell you. I said, you know, wrestling fans are great, but if it's not like directly tied into wrestling. You could probably expect about twenty dollars right. in donations, and then he came back. He's like, "Well, you're right. You, you're wrong. We raised fifteen. Uh, <laughs> but the word gets out. You know, the word gets out there, and that's why it's it's frustrating to try to tell people like, listen, you, you can't just make your uh, your timeline a nonstop series of posts for good causes as much as you might like to, yeah. because there isn't a, generally a good." Um, turnaround and that's why i try to involve it in wrestling you know it's photo sale after the show it's a uh, the um the raffle that raised over a hundred thousand the wrestlemania dream vacation raffle raised over a hundred thousand dollars for rain is really cool and then the, the wrestling community really takes pride in the fact that they did that um but yeah maybe i mean yeah well where's tony live Tony in la guy he's in the midwest somewhere i know he told us because we were the first per- people he hit up he said he lives in a very small town within a couple mile of a radius, and uh, he has a manual wheelchair. So what he really needed was, uh, I think it's called a, a fly, or uh, it's an electric wheelchair that costs a couple thousand dollars. And so we started putting the word out, and I think he's relatively close to getting the money he needs because he, he wants. Is, he you know, is getting close, yeah. So maybe you guys can provide that link, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait till he's almost there, and then I'm going to be the hero with the last donation. <laughs> Santa <laughs> oh, Claus returns. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mick, we got to ask. Hey, one. can I tell you? A, can I tell you a touching story about? <laughs> yes, please. Funding a worthy cause and being a hero. Um, uh, I have a good friend that uh, who's a. Um, she's involved in the adult arts, you know, adult <laughs> entertainment field. I have a couple and, of uh, those friends as well. That's okay. <laughs> I'm all too familiar with that. <laughs> she, one, uh, so. I saw that she was funding a movie called called Slut, a documentary film, but the uh, you know the sad. Uh, it said, uh, I guess, tendency to shame people in schools and in public for their sexuality, and I and I thought it's been it's a good it's a good cause and it looks like a really interesting movie. And I talked to the film's director. And I liked where they were going. I said, I, I don't think they're going to reach the goal. So I said, I would match everything dollar for dollar until we met our goal. And we're getting pretty close. You know, we're like a thousand dollars away. And so I. Uh, Texted my friend Siri. <laughs> you guys can <laughs> viewers can check her out at Siri Porn Star on uh, on Twitter. She's very entertaining as well as beautiful. And I said, "Hey, how'd you like to be a uh, 
a hero. And she said, what do you have in mind? And I explained what I was doing. I was $1,000 away. And I'm looking at the screen, and I see $500 pop up. And I said, is that you? And she said, you know, I, I get the kind of causes that I believe in. And I said, man, and I had they wrote her this heartfelt thing about how her contributions were going to help, you know, help thousands of people. And she said, Nick, I'm so happy to know you. You're such a great friend. Now, if you excuse me, Brad and I are going out to the sex club. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? To each his own. You you know, that's that's one thing that I, I know uh, you've, you've talked about that on stage and everything about how you have friends in that industry. And, and, you know, there's no reason to judge. People can do great work and regardless of what industry you're in, and you could touch people no matter what you're doing. So that's a good thing. Oh, yeah. Sometimes yeah, it's I agree, I agree that. <laughs> so we, And they've got... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have like four or five uh, friends in the. Uh, uh, speaking of rain, um, uh, when I was raising money a few years ago, uh, a lot of you know the, my, my friends in that industry wanted to help. Like they were the most eager to help. They really were, for reasons that you know you might you might be able to take a guess at. And uh, I I had to ask the. Uh, <laughs> the I had to ask the president of the organization if it was okay if my my adult film friends started tweeting. And the <laughs> question I got was like, they said, "Well, Scott wants to know how many of these friends you have." And I said, "Oh, yeah, four or five. And he goes, "Oh, four or five? That's no problem." And I said, "No, no, no, four out of five. Like eighty <laughs> percent of my friends are." <laughs> <laughs> hey, it keeps you in good shape. Uh... <laughs> Hey guys, I gotta run out to the ice house here today. Uh, I got me in just a minute here, but uh, I really appreciate uh, you uh, uh, taking the time. And you guys can vouch that it's a good show, right? Oh, Mick, oh, I mean, absolutely. we we did the I did the show with you last year, uh, just about a year ago to this day, and it was amazing. Then a year later, you've had even more stories and more time to to, to own your you know to hone the stage act and. It's a great show, and you don't even have to be a wrestling fan to enjoy it because you know your personality. You're just an infectious guy, and like you're 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 very positive on stage, and, and I appreciated that. And, and it was an honor to host that show. It really was, and and hopefully we'll get to do uh, it again. I, well, well, thank you. Yeah, I feel bad that I'm skipping out on uh, I'm not doing it. It was like a tradition, you know. We had two years, another year would have made it a tradition. Yeah, uh, maybe I should have done it instead. I'm doing uh, the outskirts, so uh, uh, please check it out. It'll be a completely different show than the one you saw. Uh, last year, but it's uh, one I'm having a lot of fun with. I appreciate the exposure, guys, and uh, we'll we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can tell you that the staff at the Ice House is fantastic. The Brea Improv, they're great. So have a great week, guys. If you want to check out Mick Foley, August 13th, Ontario Improv, August 14th, the Brea Improv, August 15th and 16th, Ventura Harbor Comedy Club, and the 31st Comedy Works South in Denver. Mick Foley, we will talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Mick. Bye. Bye. How fun is Mick Foley just to talk to? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty laid back. I like he's it. He's a chill. He's a chill dude, man. He's, he's you know he's been somehow his body has survived his entire career, and now you know he's giving the gift of his mind to everybody because he's such a warm guy. You know, I mean, figuratively and literally, you know, he's donated his brain to science after he passes away to be like studied and. I did know, not for, know that, for but Chris Nowitzki's foundation. That's awesome. That's yeah, cool. he, and he's just like such a good guy. Like, look at all the good he's doing for people. Yep. And uh, it's a funny dude, too. It shows, it shows very entertaining. Well, from one WWE Hall of Famer to the other, let's get into Booker T. All right. It is time once again for WWE Hall of Famer, the godfather of reality of wrestling, realityofwrestling.com, the godfather of this show. Find him on Twitter at Booker T 5 x He's Booker T. What's up, sir? What up? <laughs> <laughs> you never cease to amaze us, my friend. <laughs> I had to throw a little something, something different in there today, man. But I feel great, man. What's going on with you guys? Not much. You know, it's the party of the summer uh, right now. You're getting into town in a few days. Um, it's going to be an exciting weekend. Yeah, man. The prelude to the biggest party of the summer, you know, along with the biggest fight of the summer as well. John Cena meets Brock Lesnar, the beast in corner, you know, right in the middle of that square circle in the main event. Right there in L.A., man. It's going to be on, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I want to see the beat, the beat down in person, you know what I mean? I want to see um, exactly how that thing's going to play out. Uh, a lot of interest in that match for me. Last time they got together, it got messy. Do you have any predictions for, for this go-round? 
Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as predictions, um, with uh, Brock Lesnar, John Cena, uh, definitely it's going to be it's gonna be a war. Let me tell you something, Brock, Brock Lesnar, uh, for these last two years, has definitely um, brought it each and every time that he's come out there in the middle of the ring and uh, performed. Uh, you, he, he didn't phone it in or anything like that. He definitely has given it, you know, 100%, 100% uh, no less than 100% each and every time he stepped into the ring. And John Cena, no less, you know, he's a guy that's going to go out there and perform. He's uh, he's Shakespeare. He's old school. He's going to go out there and, and bring it as well. And one thing about John, he, he, he can, he can uh, take it, you know, just as well as he can give it, you know. So it's going to be a knockdown drag out from that perspective. But I'm looking for... For, for Brock Lesnar to, uh, you know, walk away the new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. That's my prediction. Wow. There nice. You go. Now, I know we're working PG, but you got to expect some blood to be spilled, right? That match? Uh, I mean, even if it's by accident. <laughs> 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 I mean, Brock Lesnar, you know what I mean? He, he's, a little, he's a little reckless. You know, he's always been that way. He's always been on the edge. Even before he left WWE and went to the UFC, he was, you know, he was raw. You know, in the ring, you know, I mean, uh, guys uh, necessarily didn't like to go out there and, you know, work with him because they knew they was going to get beat up a little bit. You know, so um, definitely, uh, you know, uh, there's going to be some blood. I'm looking forward to it. Now, how much do you think Paul Heyman is going to have an impact on the outcome of this match? You know, I don't think uh, Paul Heyman is going to have an outcome, you know, I mean, you know, an interest in this match at all other than being out there on the side of, you know, Brock Lesnar, I mean, just like at uh, WrestleMania, uh, he didn't do anything. He had no um, outside interest, you know, no outside involvement, you know, um, in that matchup. No, you know, shenanigans or anything like that. Brock Lesnar went out there. And that's the, that's the good thing about Brock Lesnar. Um, he's not the um, the heel character that goes out and needs somebody to come out there and help him. You know, he goes out there and wins. You know, on his own, uh, or, you know, he goes out there and loses on his own. That's what I, I liked about Brock Lesnar's, uh, you know, comeback also. He's been willing to go out there and, you know, do both ways right there in the middle of the ring. And, Book, we're looking at the whole card here. I mean, this is a phenomenal lineup of matches. There's there's really not a weak match. And, obviously, we're talking about, you know, Cena and Lesnar. But is, is there one other match to you that's really standing out? I mean, I'm looking at all of them, and, and they all have something very unique about them. I mean, you know, I mean, for me, you know, um, coming up, you know, it's always been about, been about being in a position where you can go out there and, you know, uh, make your, you know, career in one night and uh, put yourself on the map. You know, and uh, the two guys I think uh, that have a chance to do that is Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. They have a chance to go out there and, you know, steal the show, uh, go out there and leave those fans with a uh, feeling that they're going to remember uh, for the rest of their lives. You know, I mean, for this one night, they, they have that chance. Uh, they're two young guys, um, but it's going to be up to them to go out there and uh, think their way through that match approaches and thinking they can go out there and work their way through that match. I'm looking forward to seeing exactly, you know, how well those two young guys go out there and do it because I've heard so many good things, you know, about them, you know, as far as past matches, you know, they've had, you know, um, but now they're going to get a chance to go out there and do it, you know, on the big screen. I'm um, at SummerSlam, you know, I've got a lot of good memories uh, for, from Summer, SummerSlam and hopefully uh, one of these two guys can, you know, walk away. Both of them can walk away to, um, with some good memories as, as well. Now, when Dean Ambrose jumped out of that big present and surprised Seth Rollins, did that remind you a little bit of when you tried to surprise Stone Cold at the supermarket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of a little bit, <laughs> you know, but uh, I mean, uh, they've been playing that stuff on the network like crazy lately, so I've been getting the chance to uh, see it, you know, uh, it's, it's timeless, uh, but uh, definitely, uh, was, uh, it, it reminded me of, of it uh, slightly, uh, a little bit. <laughs> All right, now, now, Book, the match that I want to get your thoughts on is this Stephanie McMahon versus Brie Bella match. And the real reason I want to know what your thoughts on it are is because of this new revelation that we've been given about apparently your man, Debry, has been cheating on his wife. Jesus. I mean, yeah, man, you know, those are, you know, those are rumors, you know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of hard to cheat on your wife when you're laid up with a, a broken neck. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I mean I, I'm wondering how much work can he put in? <laughs> that is a you recuperation know, I haven't heard of. Well, well, the woman is quote a physical therapist. She can probably know what she's doing. <laughs> well, I mean, if she's a nurse or something like that, a physical aid, maybe something did pop off. You know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? But those are rumors. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I'm gonna let that play out. You know. Uh, 
you know, the, the way it will, but um, as far as the Brie Bella, Stephanie McMahon match, uh, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, much better than most people uh, can actually uh, think. Uh, <laughs> due to the fact, you know, um, I look at the, um, you know, the, the, the person that she, um, you know, mentored under, you know, which is Vince McMahon. And, and one thing about Vince, um, you know, Vince always went out and had a, a good match. You know what I mean? He always brought it. He always had it. No matter what, you know, uh, uh, he always went out no matter what. You know, Vince McMahon was willing to, you know, step in there. So I'm thinking Stephanie, you know, she's been, uh, you know, training for this. She's been thinking about this moment for quite some time. She's definitely uh, looking forward to it just the way she set the moment up. You know what I mean? Almost goaded. You know, Bree to actually, you know, calling for a match like that, and then, you know, just totally just jumped on and, you know, you know, uh, Molly whopped her, you know, at the same <laughs> time, and then, you know, uh, disrespected her at the same time as well. So it's going to be good. I'm looking forward to, uh, I always say that's the Shuggy Ducky Clack Clack moment, you know, the week for me. So um, I'm going to be looking forward to it. Yeah, I think, I think it's easy to forget that Stephanie, I mean, it's been a while, but Stephanie was a women's champion back in the day. So she, she shouldn't be taken lightly if anybody's thinking it's not going to be a, a, a good match. You know, that's the thing, you know, I mean, it's been so long, you know, people forgot about that, you know, people forgot about, you know, Stephanie be actually being active, you know, in the ring, you know, and like I said, she's a McMahon, you know, she's a fighter, I mean, you, you don't um, get that far in life without being able to go out there and uh, fight uh, for what, what what you believe in, so uh, I'm looking forward to it, and I think Stephanie's going to beat her down, to be honest, uh, that's what I look at, uh, Stephanie McMahon will walk out with the winner of that match. Oh, wow, that's a that's a bold prediction right there. Jesus, I, I mean, mean, she does have that pedigree down pretty pat right there, you know. Yeah, that was a good. Pedigree. Yeah, yeah, you could tell. You could tell she's been down at the training facility down in Florida working on it. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell she's been in the gym, you know, putting in some hours. You know, they flashed a uh, shot of her on Twitter, you know, when she was feeling the, you know, uh, trapezius muscles. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> back last spread was looking pretty good. You know what I mean? As well as the biceps was uh, peaking uh, right about at this moment. You know, so I'm looking forward to seeing exactly what kind of outfit she's going to wear out there, you know, for SummerSlam as well. Now, now, book. There's there's one other person that's on this card that I really want to get your thoughts on because you probably had a couple run-ins with him back in your WCW days, and that, of course, is Chris Jericho, and he's going against Bray Wyatt. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be a uh, you know intriguing match right there. You know, I mean. Uh... Uh, Bray Wyatt is, uh, he's, he's the, you know, new guy, new kid on the block, the new guy that's looking to, you know, make a big splash, you know, uh, moving forward here in WWE. I mean, for years to come, he looked like he's, he's going to be that guy, that cactus jack, you know, um, you know, type of character that's going to be around for a long time. But of course, Chris Jericho, uh, take nothing away from him. He's going to go out there and fight. Uh, he's always been a fighter. You know, um, uh, I, I talked about, you know, the, the big fight that he had with, you know, Goldberg back in the day in the locker room, you know, where, you know, double, double leg takedown, quick, quick, too. Uh, so, so the, the, one thing about all those Canadian guys, too, all of them are willing to go out there and, um, get hit in the mouth and, um, <laughs> go out there and fight you, you know what I mean? And Chris Jericho has always been that type of guy. No doubt about that. Now let's uh, switch to reality of wrestling. I believe there was a big event, the follow up to the pay per view, uh, this past, uh, this past weekend. How'd the live event go? You know, man, I was in Chicago, um, but I was watching it via, um, via Skype. And um, I tell you, man, you know, my guys went out there and rocked it. You know, um, even though I wasn't there, I think they stepped up even more um, and went out there and did their jobs. Uh, the reality of wrestling um, stars, I call them stars, not superstars, because they just not at that level yet. They're not making superstar money. <laughs> That's the only reason I don't call them that. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I tell you, um, you know, Abel Andrew Jackson, he stepped up, um, you know, the mysterious Q, um, he stepped up. The, the girls' tag match um, uh, um, went out there, they went out there and rocked at cinema. Uh, of course, the uh, the Diamonds champion, you know, she went out there and did her thing. She got beat up on, but she still went out there and did her thing. So big props to the girls going out there and doing their thing while, you know, uh, Booker T was out there in Chicago still trying to make the wheels turn. But I tell you, um, uh, Big Stevie Ray, um, he was there. Uh, he, he actually uh, got a new client, um, you know, and, under um, Stevie Ray, um, you know, Incorporated, which is uh, Gender Mahal, formerly Whoa. Gender, I mean, formerly, formerly Gender Mahal. Now he's uh, Rajin Singh, and uh, uh, he's uh, under the uh, expert tutelage now of Big 
Stevie Ray. Uh, so um, that right there just popped off this week. Uh, so uh, things are happening um, in reality of wrestling. Of course, um, the pay-per-view is still online right now. We'll be up for, uh, I think we got about 15 days or so um, left that we're going to be airing it. So definitely go to Reality of Wrestling dot com and I'll log on and check it out and see exactly what the reality of wrestling stars is all about. These guys are definitely are bringing it out and I, I compare my wrestlers to any wrestlers wrestlers in the country. That's how good these guys really are. Absolutely. And then next week we'll announce the winner of the Skype call. So boom. Right. Now, now book, I also heard a little rumor that Carlito has been lurking around reality of wrestling and he might be there a little bit more in the future. Can you Shed any light on this for us? Oh man, I don't have to get about Carlito. Definitely, uh, Carlito was there. He had a big, uh, he had a big run in actually. You know, I don't want to give it away. You know what I mean? Because it's going to air in a, uh, a couple of weeks. But he had a big run in with the Mysterious Q. He confronted um, the Mysterious Q this weekend. Um, they had a little bit of a knockdown drag out. I don't want to give it away, but um, it was. Um, um, it got hotter than heated and something I should have been there because I, I had something that shouldn't have happened um, so quickly here in reality of wrestling. That, so that just tells me Carlito is trying to make a play here in reality of wrestling and um, perhaps become, you know, um, the reality of wrestling champ because right now that's the guy he's got his eye on, the Mysterious Q. That's not cool for Mysterious Q then. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's no, not going to be cool, but I'm going to tell you right now. I mean, Carlito definitely, uh, he, he's the, you know, second generation, you know, uh, wrestler. I mean, he's seen it all. He's been there. His dad, you know, Carlos Colon, definitely um, taught him well. But I'm going to tell you right now, I taught the mysterious Q. Um, he trained at the, you know, uh, WXF, uh, Reality of Wrestling's uh, training facility. And uh, this kid ain't no joke. He, he's nothing to be played with. Big 455 splash off the top of the cage on the on the, uh, the the Samoan beast to pin him one two three to win the reality of wrestling heavyweight champion. I'm gonna tell you right now that's a feat right there in itself to go out there and beat the Samoan beast because I mean he took the 450 splash you know off the top. I mean uh, I mean the big um, uh, big Samoan uh, splash off the top and they kicked out of it. That's how bad this guy is. So mysterious, mysterious Q. I'm gonna tell you I'm looking for this guy to make a play in the big time sometime real real soon he's going to get a trial so I, I hate that i hate that this kid is going to get a trial <laughs> because i'm gonna i'm gonna lose him because that's how good he is so uh, carlito don't be sleeping on the mysterious cue man because you might get that cue cutter and it could be all over no doubt about that before we go book uh we also have goldberg on the show tonight and obviously you guys spent a great deal of time where together is where is he what where is he yeah, we talked to him. No, no, no. He, <laughs> later, we have him later on. We have to, we have to call him and stuff like that. But I mean, <laughs> man, yeah, yeah, lucky man. What kind? Of, <laughs> give it, give us a Goldberg uh, experience or story. Goldberg stories. Absolutely. Oh, man, you know, I mean, you know, you know. I mean, Goldberg. Uh, honestly, you know, uh, you know, Goldberg always been a good friend of mine. You know, and uh, you know. It was, uh, I, I, and this is, this is something I'm just thinking about right now. You just like totally hit me with it. I think, uh, Charles had told me to think of a, a Goldberg story, but I've been working, I've been doing stuff. That's all but, good. Uh, Goldberg, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but, uh, Goldberg's always been a real, real good friend of mine. He's one of the guys that, um, gravitated, you know, um, to me, um, back in WCW, um, uh, you know, um, out of all the guys, you know, in the locker room, you know, and, uh, and uh, this is a, this kind of like a feel good story. And uh, um, when I, you know, came to uh, WWE, and I had been there for a while, and then Goldberg came in. And uh, Goldberg was, you know, he wasn't, you know, uh, you know, he didn't warm up the guys, you know, uh, you know, um, that that well, you know, um, he was kind of standoffish, you know. But he came up to me, and he goes, "Man, you know, I really feel good to have a friend here." you know, alongside me here at the WWE. So, you know, uh, one thing about Goldberg, him and I, we've always been, been good, good friends. Um, it's going to always be that way. If he, if he ever needed me for anything, all he got to do is get in touch with me, and I'll definitely I'll be there for him. Beautiful, man. Well, Booker T, uh, we can't wait to see you this weekend. I'm sure we'll run into each other Saturday or Sunday at SummerSlam. So, uh, once again, thank you for the time, and uh, it's going to be a great weekend in Los Angeles. Oh, man, the biggest party of the summer is going down. I mean, the play, prelude to the biggest fight 
of the summer. It's going to be old like a steaming pot of neck bones. And like I always say, now can you get that sucker? And I'm out. <laughs> See you, Book. All right, so we talked SummerSlam with Booker. We might as well give our predictions. Yeah. This card is stacked. Stacked and packed. It is. And there's no pre-show, I don't think. No pre-show. They haven't announced one. Wait, you're telling me that none of these matches are going to be like WWE Network pre-show? Hold on a minute, player. I don't think so. They haven't said so far. That could be a SmackDown thing, though. We don't know. You know what, though? There's one thing that we don't have on this card. Tag team match. Nope. Never no, got it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they mentioned something about the Usos having a match on the pre-show. Okay. I feel like I've heard that somewhere. Well, I know they're on main event, but I don't Maybe know. Maybe that's uh, what I it think was. it was a main event thing. It'd be silly to not defend the titles at SummerSlam. I would think they'd have to put them on something. Well, they don't have to. The next pay-per-view is that's Night true. of Champions, you gotta, so we'll get all the titles in. Very good point. No doubt about it. We well, shall see. Well, let's get uh, let's just get cracking. Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns. Um, you know. You are so stupid. Oh, that was the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right. She's involved in every match. Yeah, I mean, she really, really is. Uh, so I think I know what I'm going. Uh, Chuck, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to go with Randy Orton, even though. Really? I want, well, I really want Randy Orton to win. I don't think Roman Reigns is ready for this big push that they're about to give him yet because his mic skills just aren't up to par for me. Okay. And while the powers that be probably don't see it that way. I'm also a huge mark for Randy Orton, so I'm going Orton. All right. No way. Reigns all the way. I also am going with Reigns. Believe that! <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, AJ Lee versus Paige Divas Championship. Uh, I would love for Paige to win it back and this just continue to bounce between the two ladies. I feel like they're both so strong in the ring and they're having good promos with each other. I, I would just like to see them continue to... Pop the belt between the two of them for a while. It's a tough one. Uh, yeah, this is a this is one that's really up in the air for me. Chucky, AJ Lee, mm-hmm. retain. Yeah, it's not switching hands on her this fast. The only the benefit though is that they would both come out of it like six time champions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it could be a cool. And we haven't seen something like that. Titles don't tend to bounce as much as they used to. So, right. I don't know. It could be kind of cool to, to never know who's going to get it. I mean, Paige definitely got the upper hand on Raw because there's no better upper hand than helping Eva Marie beat you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> the... I mean. Damn. That was one lazy roll-up. Well, it's like I've had a fruit roll-up that had like more. <laughs> she rolled up AJ Lee and then fell asleep. I know, yeah. Ugh, it was a gosh, weird. Yeah. It looked weird. I knew it was Ugh. a good decision when I decided to fast-forward that one. <laughs> Oh. Well, you didn't have to fast forward for long. Yeah, it was like a minute, not even. What I mean, I understand why though that Eva Marie was out there because they're I mean, they're starting to just make it public. There's no more embarrassing person to lose to on the Divas roster than Eva Marie. Well, and she didn't really have to do that much. So if you want to find a match to infuse her in, I don't know if you guys saw the NXT match that she was in, but the crowd was brutal. Lividly upset with that match. Like Ugh. they were chanting like worse than batista or there's like all these wow. like wow when you get a worse than batista <laughs> chant well, damn. Hey, lay off him he was great in guardians oh uh, yeah i did like guardians i'll so, tell you what so how long was that match on nxt a couple minutes it wasn't that long it was against bailey it wasn't that long but it was enough to realize that she didn't she hasn't improved one bit in the ring right i mean She's, that that roll up itself it's like dude if you're gonna roll up the divas champion make it look like you're struggling at least yeah stick them legs out give it a little tension in it yeah because because of that she made aj lee look like she was an easy person to pin because she just wasn't even tr she rolled her up and it didn't even did, no struggle she could have been tickling her for all we know <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah uh how about Z ziggler and miz what do uh, y'all think who are you taking with a uh, page aj lee uh, Paige, I already said. Oh, wow. I just want to point out that y'all took more time to talk about that match than the match itself lasted. I know. I'm just saying, you know, people probably want to vent it's about it. So Eva Murray, you know. So I got to break the tie here. You're saying AJ. You're saying Paige. Man, um, I'm gonna have to go. I'm going AJ. Gotta, gotta go AJ. I mean, I love her as champ. I just think it'd be cool to get a little little competition in there. I'm with you. Moving on, Dale. What we got? Ms. Ziggler, Intercontinental Championship. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one for me that I could see going either way. I, I think this is the hardest match on the card to call. Yeah. But, I, like, by far, like, look, you know, I say Randy Orton's going to win, but we, we all know what's probably going to happen in that right. match. But, like, with this one, it really could go either way. 
Miz is hot from returning. That's that's one thing to his advantage, and and he has a new character, so it always tends to help if you have yep. a belt to to gloat about, especially a character that is just gloating basically and trying to avoid getting hit in the face. It's fun to watch. I don't think that this is going to be the payoff, regardless. So no. whoever wins, I think we're going to continue to see this for a while, and I think we all win by having that happen. This match could be. I mean, I, really, any of these matches could kind of steal the show. Although I think Cena Lesnar is going to be just a freaking blockbuster. Yeah. But. I mean, Ziggler and Miz, I think we already know Ziggler's over. He's going to be over. There's nothing he can do to not be over. Whereas the Miz, I feel like that title just really represents the whole character. It looks good on him, too, with the shades and the new, the new you know, outfit. The, Those the boat, only shoes. Thing to, boat the shoes. The only thing to counter that is is that, you know, Triple H has come out there and like been like very, they've been very self-aware of like what they've done with Ziggler. And he, you know, even had that promo a couple weeks ago where he's talking about like, and this guy, you know, we he doesn't win, but y'all still love him, kind of thing. Remember, right. like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so I, I think it's one of those things where like, I feel like they have to give Ziggler this win at some point, really, to satisfy. What about a DQ? You're not, you're not saying a title change. I'm not though, saying right? a title change. I'm just saying that like, I do not think this match has a clean finish, okay. and I think that Miz will walk out with the title still. How that happens, I do not know. The only other thing I could see happening would be that Miz goes to protect his face in some way, and Ziggler uses it to his advantage to get the win. Yeah. <laughs> he had a, Ziggler had a great tweet that said, uh, uh, Maurice is the best, dot, 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 wrestler, dot, 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 in your house. <laughs> at, at the Miz. <laughs> I thought that was so great. Nice. Dude, Mar- yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, Maurice was getting in on the little Twitter war, too, because she was like tweeting like some sexy-ass pictures of herself and being like, hey, Ziggler. Only the Miz gets this, so you know. Uh, I was like, "Whoa, man. hey now!" Look, I mean, any I mean picture, that's all right. Mm-hmm. Any picture of Maurice is a good picture of Maurice. Truth. Yeah, that's right. So, what's the prediction? Oh, so I'm gonna pick Miz. All right. Uh, I'm gonna pick Ziggler via a DQ. I love how we're all divided. I'm going Miz. Moving on, Chris Jericho. Shot. The hell up! Versus Bray Wyatt. This one, uh, this one's gonna get nasty. Yeah, I mean, Chris Jericho has been on a roll. I, I don't. I like that he came back and has been winning matches. You know, one thing I was concerned about was we had talked about this before, having a bit of an RVD kind of run where he just comes in and it's great to see him in the ring and put over younger wrestlers. <laughs> but RVD. he needs to get a win for it to. I don't know. Uh, to me, it just bothers me a little bit. But. Chris has been on a great roll, and I think that this will culminate with him losing to uh, Bray Wyatt at SummerSlam. One on one, no Wyatt family, probably. Do we do we really think the Wyatts don't find a way to get involved though? Sneakily, mm. as sneakily as this two men that size can be. I mean, how, yeah. you gonna, how are you going to have a SummerSlam without the Wyatt family? That's my question. <laughs> Why are those two Christmas trees at ringside? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, they have Hulk weird Hogan. ornaments. <laughs> more Hulk Hogan birthday presents? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There you go. <laughs> so what do you think, Chuck? I think. Uh, Bray wins this one. Mm-hmm. I, I, he needs to. He didn't win at WrestleMania. It's not like, I don't know, for somebody who's on the cusp of, of breaking his... into the top tier, I really want him to get a good, solid, clean win, which is why I would like the Wyatts to not be at ringside, because I want him to just get it on his own merit. You, you know, here's the thing, though. I know that the WWE has a lot of faith in Bray, because I saw an interview earlier this week where Triple H was talking about how, like, he said Bray's his guy kind of thing, where when he was Husky Harris, right. a lot of people wanted to release him and let him go. He said, no, let me take him. Let me see what I can do with him. And, you know, so I think that Triple H has a lot of invested in him. That It's a great investment. So, yeah. you know. Wasn't Triple H also invested in Sin Cara? Well, I mean, you win some, <laughs> you lose some. <laughs> Can't always be right. Look, they make a lot of mistakes, and then they make some All good, the more you know. reason why mm-hmm. Triple H ain't going to let this one get effed up either. Mm-hmm. Bray, Bray is on point. I'll give you that. So His promo hopefully... this week was wow. Both oh. of them. Yeah. They both sounded great on that, that it, interview. It quote, was quote. odd at first when they're both sitting in a room and then they shoo Michael Cole away, and then they're just staring at each other. I'm like, this is weird. I love, I love how Michael Cole was hope, hyping that thing all the way up to it, too. Like, I had this sit-down interview with uh-huh. Bray and Jericho. I'm like, you putz, you didn't even interview him. Get and out and of then here. JBL falls over. That's a great interview, Michael! <laughs> <laughs> was one of his best. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're all going, are we all going Bray? I think we are. Yep. I think we're all going Bray. Now, the next one, Jack Swagger. 
versus Rusev. Shut up! Rusev sounds like a woman in that. Well, club. you've never heard him. Sp- well, he he his octave is a little off. Oh, you you sped it up. Yeah. Um, man, I my prediction for this, I, I gotta think that Swagger is gonna win because he can win it by getting the flag, and he doesn't have to pin or make Rusev tap out. So I think he he. He's beaten, but he's not pinned, so he still keeps a bit of a record here. And it's like, how are you not going to have America go over? I, I echo know. both those sentiments. You know, that that's just the way it has to be. SummerSlam is like the most American feeling. I don't know why, but it always feels very It's because like, people eat hot dogs in the summer. They sure do. Yeah, that's right. But I, I do think that I think that's going to be one of those matches that's going to be very entertaining, but we all kind of – I think WWE knows like that's how they're booking it. They, I think they're – very aware that we know that, but I yeah. think it still could be a really good match. It's so hot. I mean, uh, Swagger, Russo, I, people well, are very hungry is, for it. Is Rush is being a bunch of dicks right now. Oh, man. <laughs> Which it does is not timely. help. It is timely. It really is. Right now, or hasn't it always been Well, they've been always been way? dicks, but like this is the biggest dicks they've been since the Cold War, I think. Or maybe since the 85, 80, mid-80s-ish. So, so the Cold War. <laughs> they're never, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Not, they're not great. They're not great. Yeah, so we're going, we're going to America. Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, my feud of the year in a lumberjack match. We had thought maybe it would be for the Money in the Bank briefcase, not the case. I can't wait to see this one. Not the case. Hey, good one. Um, I don't know, man. This one's a hard one for me. Dean popping out of that big ass present. <laughs> this one is more obvious to me than I think some of the other ones, and I could be completely wrong on this. Why? But I think Dean Ambrose wins. Really. And thus, he's like, hey, look, your money in the bank, I just beat you, I deserve that briefcase, and then the next one gets set up for them to fight for the case. I feel like that's got to be a Survivor Series match, though. It depends. I mean, if, if the next one is Night of Champions, does a briefcase count as a championship? It kind of does, so it could still be in theme well, for, How many for that. championships do you know that got doused with popcorn and pop and soda? Soda pop. I mean, at least a couple. Probably. <laughs> at least covered in milk. I'm sure one of them I mean, was look, covered look, in here, milk. And, and here's also part of my thinking, too. When I look at this one, I'm like, all right, I would rather see Dean Ambrose face either John Cena or Brock Lesnar as opposed to Seth Rollins. So, oh, But this feud is so good, though. Come right, but now. I'm saying, I'm saying in, the long term, run. in the long run, I'm hoping that this feud culminates with Dean Ambrose getting that briefcase. You think they would make Dean champion before Seth Rollins? If they were smart. <laughs> I don't know. Who do you predict, Chuck? I'm going Dean Ambrose all the way in this one. Okay. Dale. I feel like Dean's been getting a lot of comeuppance lately. I yes. feel like he's he's been kind of getting Seth's number, so I, I'm going with Rollins. I, I also got to go with Rollins because I feel like Dean has to keep chasing, and he's got to keep chasing eventually That's the, the fun briefcase. Of it, right? yeah. yeah. So I think at some point, and, and also, let's not forget, Triple H doesn't have a match. He's currently not heavily involved in anything on the card. You know he's going to stick his nose into something. Yeah, or send out Kane, corporate Kane. I might even send an Instagram. <laughs> so he's going to do something. So I think this is, uh, this is one where I think he's going to help out Seth Rollins. Two matches left. Oh, man, this one, man. Stephanie McMahon versus Brie Bella. What the hell? They've both been arrested. Both been arrested. I'm pretty sure that that uh, chick that came out, Megan, I'm pretty sure that's all a work from Stephanie. Do not get me started. Okay, okay, I will start on that. Okay, Uh, look, I was actually like really into this feud and was really liking the way they booked it up until they decided to pull one of the worst storylines in TNA's history and just regurgitate it into a WWE story. Did you know Claire Lynch was trending last night nationwide yeah. in the wrestling Yeah, and I was also seeing Katie Vick crop up there quite a bit, too. <laughs> oh, God, Because no. people were like, are we going Katie Vick on this uh, one? no. It's just so, going to turn out to be Stephanie said it so that she would hit her. I don't think that this is an actual storyline of that, Daniel Bryan cheating on his wife. It's got to be over by Sunday. God. Yeah, I think, I, she'll, I think it'll come out of the bag. She'll be having some conversation with Megan, and we'll overhear that she's like, oh, i got to send you that check for... What you, you know for your services for taking care of whatever, and that's then Bree will wa- walk up. That trick it, she get some Drew Barrymore delivery with the side mouth talking. Ugh. So do you think we'll see high. Drew? Or, <laughs> Drew I think we'll see Drew Barrymore there. No. We could. We could. She's special guest referee. In, it is in L. A. She's but, she's run out of Adam Sandler movies to be but, in. So no, well, that's a damn. But do you truth. think we'll see Daniel Bryan there? Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's you exciting. got to right. You got to. It would be weird Probably. if he didn't pop up in a thing that he's. Now involved in, 
specifically besides think, his wife. I think there's all kinds of ways this one can go with, you know, Nikki getting involved and turning on Bree yep. to all of a sudden maybe Daniel Bryan has decided to align himself with Stephanie, maybe even cost Bree. Like all these crazy things in my head I could come up with, none of which I think will actually happen, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll could see. be fun. I think, I think he'll show his face. I don't know what that will mean, but I, this, this is a work. This is not an actual It better be. Line. There's no way. I sure as hell don't appreciate giving physical therapist a slutty name. Johnny, that's you're asked to London for a chick. How are you going to defend hey, she wasn't physical a patient. therapy? She wasn't listen, a patient, Dale. Listen, Johnny being slutty is nothing any of us have to worry about, okay? <laughs> uh, that is very, very true. Believe that! <laughs> so what's the prediction, though? What do you think? Uh, Stephanie, all the way. Okay. Oh, man, it's tough to say. I I want to say Bree. What, what if Bree wins and then Nikki turns? Does that make sense? I don't know. I, you know what? You know what? I'm going to retract Probably it. I'm going to say I think Nikki costs Bree this match, and Stephanie comes out on top. Yeah, I. That's kind of what I want to see. But but on the flip side, do we really want to see a Bella fin, Bella twins feud between each other? I think that could work. It'd be fine. I, I don't know. They're just trying to give us something to think about Daniel Bryan until Daniel Bryan is back. So I don't know if that's the right thing or if they're going to use that to lead into Total Divas. I mean, you got to think about the whole machine rather than just the little parts. Yeah. I know, but it's more fun when we get to think about just the little parts. <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, what she said. Nah. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go Steph McMizzo as well. Uh, all right. Well, now it's uh, it's stop it's, copying my picks, John. Well, I'm not trying to copy your picks, dude. Sure. Look, bro. Sure. Brilliant minds think alike. <laughs> all right. So, um, man, this is it. We got uh, we got John Cena versus Brock Lesnar for the damn title. Party's over, Grandpa. I gotta agree with Booker T here. I think Lesnar is going to come out the victor. They're you know they're going to be introducing those that new belt. And they like to do that with a new champ most of the time. And uh, I don't know. He He's coming off the heels of beating The Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania, in case you haven't heard. Yeah, yeah I've heard of it. So I, I just feel like it wait, would be really? weird. He, mm. he beat the... No, oh, yeah. wait. My name is Paul Heyman. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I got to think Brock's going to take this one. But Cena's promo had me wondering last night. Oh, you mean this one? Diverticulitis, or hepatitis, or laryngitis, or maybe a huge case of punk bitchitis. I've suffered from punk bitchitis a few times. You have? Yeah, it's not easy. I, I've uh, seen you go through it. It's a horrible bout. I know. I'm going to say, first of all, Cena's promo was nice, but I didn't think Paul Heyman promos could get any better, and then last night happened. And that dude was on fire he on rhymed Raw. and everything. The rhymes, everything. And even, even Brock was so timely at that at the end when he came out and said the party's over line you know like, party's over grandpa was so good <laughs> and what about the shoulder shiv he gave to piper dude i for a second i, I thought piper forgot what like what was happening yeah. and i was waiting for he him got, to legit he got that go angry look in his eye. i was really hoping we'd see him and kevin nash get a little physical right there look everyone in the ring sold it it was nice big sexy's looking limb and train <laughs> limb and train up. Messed that one up. God dang it. <laughs> he's looking lean and trim these days. There he's, you go. he's probably the only one in that ring that maybe could still do a bump, take a bump or, or yeah. do a move. I don't, well, I don't think Hulk anybody Hogan's else has been there. telling everyone he's ready to go, brother. Oh, God. No. He, he <laughs> may have one more leg drop in him, but it's got to be something so amazing. It's going to have he... to be on like a ball pit at but... Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Like he's gonna have to have something that he could really. It just pads his butt. Yeah, but but I'm telling you what, guys. Here's what's gonna happen in this match: John Cena's getting left in a pile of piss, vomit, and blood. Blood and urine and vomit. But who's gonna win the match? Courtesy of Brock Lesnar, and Brock Lesnar is walking out of there with those titles. Mm-hmm. Dale. Yep, Lesnar. I gotta tell you. I gotta go with Lesnar too. Regardless, though, shocking, this shocking. Is, on this that is, one. in my opinion, this is the most excited I've been for a John Cena main event since Money in the Bank versus CM Punk three years ago. Hmm. So I, you know what? That's I, pretty cool. I yeah. agree with you, Johnny. This is the most excited I've been for a Cena main event too, and only because I'm looking forward to seeing him get his ass handed to him. Let's do this. All right, there you have it, guys. Feel free to send us your predictions on SummerSlam. 
We can't wait. We're fortunate enough to where we're going to be there. We'll be taking pictures. We'll be tweeting them out. And obviously, uh, we're going to be at Radio Row. So we're going to have so many good interviews coming up in the next couple of months for you. Um, but with that said. And the panels. If you guys are going to the panels, right. you should let us know because we're going to be there Saturday all day pretty much. There's two on Saturday, one in the morning, one in the evening. If you guys want to meet up or just hey hello or right. make our a boy, sign together. Our, our boy Rob Schamberger is going to be out there. That's hey, right. Hey, what excited up, Rob? to see him. Rob, if you're listening, we can't wait to see you. And also one of our listeners made a sign for Raw this past week, so that was cool. Oh, yeah, that was cool. We appreciated that. Uh, Chuck, let's do it. You bet I got something to say. Well, guys, there's really only one story that matters this week in the dirt, Mm -hmm. and we all know what that is, and you all knew it was coming, and of course, that is Alberto Del Rio. The slap heard around the world. Yeah, I'm a little confused as to, did did you hear exactly, I I heard it was some kind of uh, borderline racist comment that made him slap, who I think might be the person that runs their Twitter, that's what it seems like to me. Something weird. Listen... So let's just basically what we know and what the rumors are. What we know is that, and and keep in mind that we don't know if any of this is actually true because, you know, typically when WWE fires someone or releases them, they put out a, we wish them the best in all their future endeavors. With their real name. real name, all that stuff. This time it was his storyline name. He's been released due to, you know, poor conduct or unprofessional conduct. Fine. Okay. If that was it, you'd say, okay, that's legit. That's real. Fine. Then they put out a tweet talking about how Alberto Del Rio's fans should be disappointed in him kind of thing from WWE. Yeah, they said something like, the only person Alberto should be mad at is Alberto or something, which sounds like a second grade teacher. The the only people the fans should be mad at, wasn't it? Right, right. Regardless of what it was, that seems very storyline-ish to push something. I agree. However, on the flip side, now again, don't know. Now here's where all the rumors really start to fly. On the same night as SummerSlam, Triple A in Mexico has their big pay per view that'll be available on iPay pay per view. Okay. All the rumors are circulating that Alberto Del Rio will be there and he will show up. And they're also saying that Ricardo Rodriguez might be with him. Huh. Now, do you think those firings were were a, a thing together then? N- no, no, but... no, no. There's just people are adding you know speculation to the rumors. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, and you really have to break it down and think: Hmm, could this happen? Everybody knows that WWE's contracts have a 90-day or whatever the period is of right. no-compete clause. Yeah, no-compete clause. Sure. So you have to imagine that that's in effect for Del Rio right now, unless there's some stipulation that if you get released fired. or something, fired, you know, like that. That you know, And I don't know the inner and outer workings of WWE's contracts, so I'm not going to speculate. Yeah. But I have to imagine that that would be in effect here. Now, it's a little too quick, regardless. Right. You think they now, fired him? On, you think they quote fired him on purpose so he can go do AAA? No, no, dude. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's no. what I was thinking. Maybe. No, no they don't. They don't care they, about AAA. Why no. would they? Now, see, a lot of people now. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. We all know who Conan is, mm-hmm. and Conan's been going off on Twitter about how WWE is always racist, and he's heard all this stuff, and that they're you know keeping Rey Mysterio prisoner, let Rey free, but Del Rio has spoken he's to him. Paid for God's aren't, sake. aren't his knees keeping him? Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 just just on that side note, Rey Mysterio has stopped cashing his WWE paychecks. Yeah. Jesus. So, um, says, at least says Rey Mysterio. That that's what the news reports are saying now. Again, how accurate we don't know, but that's Sound but that's not who, what we're who, here to talk about. Who's asking, to us, right? Yeah, who's asking Ray about his? Well, You've been to the bank lately. <laughs> <laughs> hey what, man, you going what, into Wells Fargo? What <laughs> Give we, me a lollipop. Oh, <laughs> Hold on a minute, player. <laughs> what we do need to talk about is the fact that Conan has been saying that Del Rio will come back to Mexico. Now, here's here's my thoughts on this, guys. Is that and Dale. Here's my favorite word for you. Mm. It's very interesting. Oh, you already just said it nine because... times. So keep going. <laughs> yeah, fuck off, Johnny. <laughs> just saying. Um, that if you remember, WWE did something similar once where they fired Daniel Bryan and he went and did all the indies. That's and, true. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. We never were really sure if that was a true firing or if it was all storyline. I'm starting to believe that this could be something like that. 
It's hard to say. It, it all the, the name not being actually put in there is when I started getting a little suspect because they always say who the actual person's name is. Yeah. Uh, we don't go through a lot of firings for a reason of we're just nothing creative for right, you. And, but, so it, I don't know if this is a different scenario, so they're breaking their own mold or whatever, but it, it does seem very odd. But the, the fact that they didn't address it on Raw at all feels like it's not a storyline because normally they'd be like, you know, we got this thing that happened. Right. They know, like, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they understand. would just want to brush it under the rug. It's very CM Punk. You know, all that. Everybody thought that was a storyline for a long time. And right. we saw how that went. You know, and it's weird, too, because on the flip side of that, you don't come out and publicly put a tweet out like they did. And you don't, you know, really talk about the reason why someone is released unless it's a story you know like there's been plenty of you know behavioral issues there's been plenty of infractions they never come out and say what it is you know like when someone's released for drug use or for steroid you know none right of they just stuff, let them go they just let them go they don't you know and it seems like so there's both sides of it and it's, i mean it's gonna be very it's a unique situation they have to let the other guy go they're, well, that's part of it too. They're talking about the fact that that guy is still with WWE right now. Yeah, he's got to go. But his if, if what he said is, if he are... really said what they think he said, then absolutely, it's a totally rude. Yeah, again, this, we don't know exactly what he said, but if it got ADR that pissed that he he slapped him that hard, yeah, ADR is a very proud man. So whatever pissed him off was probably something that really yeah. warranted a slap. Maybe I don't know. It's too bad. You I know, hope it is a storyline. You know, the, the the other thing to keep in mind here, guys, is that. Reportedly, Del Rio has been very unhappy in WWE for a long time. Yeah, he's wanted that. out of his contract, yeah. Yeah. and he has money, and he wants to go back to Mexico. Well, and do. and yeah. to further fuel that, he recently moved to Texas, which WWE speculated was because he wanted to be closer to Mexico for mm-hmm. that travel aspect. That so, a whole bunch of stuff going on there. Who knows? It'll be, it'll play out how it does. Yeah, we shall see. All right. Well, now from the dirt to. And now, this week in wrestling with Dale Rutledge. Oh, you didn't know? Uh, this week in wrestling history, pretty much every SummerSlam happened ever, so you should just go back and watch it. They're pretty freaking awesome. You can do that on the network for just $9.99. Oh, you didn't know? The greatest this week in wrestling of all time. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we're moving on to yet another special guest on the show tonight. Um, we, you're about to hear a really cool conversation with Bill Goldberg. And, you know, um, much like CM Punk, guys like Goldberg, their lives are very fascinating. They have so many elements to their lives, and they don't necessarily want to talk a ton about wrestling. And so what's cool about this is we got to talk sports. We got to talk uh, cars. We got to talk life about how involved he is in the military, and then we got into some wrestling. So I think you're, I think they're really going to enjoy this conversation. He was awesome, totally cool. He sounds yeah. a little bit like Seth Rogen if you uh, close your eyes a little bit. Hey, hey, that's a that's another fellow Jew right there. Well. And y'all, we're talking to the most famous Jew in wrestling history. <laughs> that's true. Chuck Rice. Well, well, besides me, John. Oh, okay, besides me, number two, obviously number two. Yeah, you're next, Chuck. I mean, I it, it goes Goldberg me. And then Raven. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, guys. It is time for a extremely special guest today. Uh, this man, we so many accolades. I can go for about a half hour. Uh, former WCW World Heavyweight Champion and WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Obviously, NFL player, actor, host. He is none other. And let's not forget, right now he's got a great podcast I listen to all the time called Who's Next on Podcast One, which is just really cornering the market on amazing podcasting. He is Bill Goldberg. How are you, sir? I am doing great, man. And you? <sighs> Fantastic. We couldn't believe uh, we were going to get you on the show, so we've been excited for a couple of weeks now. It's all good, man. It's my pleasure. Cool, man. So let's start off with, with who's next. Um, it's it's still in its uh, you know early stages. We're about, what, 14, 15 episodes in, I believe. Um, how's that experience been so far? Do you, really, do you enjoy doing it every week? Yeah, you know, uh, the reality is, man, I uh, I do nothing more than open up my Rolodex and, and call my friends and rekindle relationships that you know ha- haven't uh, haven't been sparked for years. Um, uh, for instance, you know, one of my guests, Chris Daughtry, who got to uh, go to his concert this last weekend. He played twenty minutes from my house. Jesus. Um, first time I met Chris was on a plane about five years ago and the last and the next time i spoke to him was on my podcast 
you know, so a lot of time uh, is in between uh, conversations with a lot of these guests that I have. But uh, if, if nothing else, it's a great it's a great opportunity for me to rekindle relationships that that were great at one time for one reason or another. And I think the uh, I think the general public wouldn't mind being a fly on the wall. You know, with me talking to Dodger, you're talking to uh, Deion Sanders, or tomorrow I'm talking to, to Earnhardt Jr. and uh, and uh, Darius Rucker. So I mean, wow. it's uh, it's a it's a different thing that I'm trying to bring to people. And so obviously, we all know it's not 90 percent wrestling. So um, it's it's just me hanging out and trying to share some of my experiences with some of my fans, and it's a it's a way to connect with them. So. I'm glad you brought up primetime. That episode was fascinating to me. You know, I grew up a massive NFL fan, still am to this day. And, uh, you know, is he the best athlete you've ever been around? Because you've been around all different types of athletes and, and just his personality, too, obviously. Yeah, I mean, there, throughout my days, yeah, there, there's no doubt I've been around some, some gnarly dudes, man, when it comes to the talent, whether it's Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker or Dion. I mean, you, you, it's really hard to name three guys who all around are, are – at the cream of the crop when it comes to just physical talent and, and, and being absolute freaks of nature. I mean, you, know, you look at Clowney, you look at at, uh, at uh, a number of guys in the NFL these days, it's much more commonplace, but back in the day, they, they stood out like a sore thumb. Um, uh, De- Dion could get the top speed in about eight yards, Jesus. and to watch him at practice was like watching Mark McGuire. You know, I, I took. I was lucky enough at one time to take BP in between Mark McGuire and Barry Larkin, hmm. and and seeing people watch in awe uh, Mark McGuire hitting a baseball out of a stadium was like watching Dion intercept the pass and run it back on a nine on seven. It's uh, these, these guys are far and away uh, above the normal athletic. Uh, uh, possibilities of the normal human being i mean they're, they're just it's unreal and it's cool it, it instantly turns you into a fan and and during mcguire's prime you were really in your prime in your career standing next to each other tail of the tape how close were you guys as far as size goes he's taller than i am okay um he's he's i think he's six five Jesus. he's a big dude mcguire at the time was huge i mean he, he's still a big guy we, uh, you know, unfortunately to the general public, uh, they don't understand we all age and we all can't <laughs> do what we used to do in the morning and started to eat 15 to 20,000 calories a day and training for four hours. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, uh, at, at the time he was, he was huge. Um, I got some good pictures of he and I standing next to each other. And I think I even got real with me hitting one out at, uh, at Miami stadium. But, uh, it was uh, it was it was back in that day, you know. You know, Conseco was huge. Yeah. Um, it was back in that day of uh, uh, of excess. You know, the bigger the better. And um, wrestling was huge back then. And fortunately, I was uh, I was uh, you know hanging around Jimmy Hart, and Jimmy Hart has a, a great uh, mind for uh, cross promotion. And we he picked up the phone and got me at, at Miami Stadium in probably fifteen minutes. We were just wrestling right down the road and it was a whim for him so uh it was a cool experience are you telling me you hit one out of miami stadium i've hit one out of i think seven out of nine of the parks that i took bp at. what the hell were you a baseball player growing up absolutely my brother got drafted by the reds at a high school and i had a huge huge fascination for baseball but i i got a little big for the sport <laughs> um in, in, in that uh in that, you know, football was my first love. Uh, obviously, I played baseball a lot more um, as a kid because my dad didn't let me put pads on, I think, until the eighth grade. Um, so uh, baseball was my thing, man. I played Legion ball, and I, I loved it. I pitched at first base and third base. It was awesome. Wow. It was see, awesome. I pictured you as a right fielder that could gun someone down at home plate. But yeah, third base and first, I could see that. Yeah, I pitched too, man. It was pretty imposing, but uh, you know, I I never had the I never had the heat on my on my fastball that everyone thought. I remember I, I threw out the first pitch at the at uh, the Astros one time, and uh, I think Biggio <laughs> caught it, and uh, I I was proud of myself because you know, like I said, I pitched back in the day, and I I like to think that I'm a pretty good all around athlete. 
And so, man, I grooved one right down the middle fastball. I went and sat by the owner. The uh, guy with the radar gun came over to me smiling, and I, I was all proud of myself. And he said, you should be happy that uh, you've got one mile an hour faster than the fast pitch softball chick did it uh, like two nights ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, th- so that I- instantly emasculated me. And uh, so now I throw a knuckleball. So the 29th of August, I'm throwing the first pitch out on Friday night for the uh, Padres to uh, – they're playing against the Dodgers, and uh, I, I'm going to, you know, in Miami, I threw the knuckleball a number of months ago, and I'm going to debut it again here in San Diego. So. You've been working on the knuckleball. <laughs> I've, been throwing a, I've been throwing a knuckleball for years, but, you know, if I'm going to spill the beans. My secret is that, 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 you know, if you know anything about baseball, knuckleball is not the easiest thing in the world to throw. No. Um, so that's an instant out. As far as if you throw a ball or if it's a wild pitch, well, hey, man, I threw a knuckleball, dude. So, you know, top that. Well, obviously it's hard. I mean, there's really only two guys that have mastered it over a career. That'd probably be, you know, Phil Necro and Wakefield. Even R.A. Dickey has kind of fallen off the last year or two. You know, i got to tell you, I watched Dickey pitch last night, and it was some of the most entertaining baseball I've ever seen. I mean, watching people try to hit that is, is pure entertainment. <laughs> have you ever tried to hit a knuckleball? Oh, absolutely. How'd it absolutely. Go? How, how difficult it's, is it? it? Yeah, it's it's very difficult. <laughs> you know, you can't predict it. You, if it's a good knuckleball, you can't predict it. So you have no idea where it's going. So it's pretty much a guessing game. Yeah, and it's so slow. To, like, I, I've never obviously hit from a major league uh, standpoint or barely even anything beyond Little League. <laughs> but a knuckleball at 60 miles an hour, I imagine, is hard to guess. Well, when I was playing Legion ball, we had kids throwing 90. And you know that was that's obviously as close as I got to playing pro baseball. But those guys, I think hitting a hitting a hitting a pitch from a uh, more than competent pitcher has got to be one of the hardest things you can do. Yeah, and no doubt about that. And you mentioned you're throwing out the pitch at the Padres game. I know you spend a lot of time, I think, in San Diego because you do a ton of stuff with the military, right? Yeah, man. I I spent uh, the good part of earlier today at. Uh, Coronado down with the seals. Um, it's hell week down there. And I mean, you want to talk about a failure rate, not a failure rate, but a, 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 I guess it's, it's attrition, but they had 120 guys go in for hell week and they had 90, I think they had 96 helmets laying on the ground and the helmet signifies, you know, a guy bowing out. Whoa. Yeah. So, uh, it was, uh, it's, I can only imagine what these guys go through. And that's only like phase one of three phases that, you know, you have to complete to become a seal and God knows what else. But, you know, we had a, we had a wonderful time. We had a great tour and got to, got to, uh, got to hang out with some wonderful men and women who, uh, fight for our country, man. It's a, it's, it's a huge honor to be able to do that. I'm speaking at a conference down in San Diego on the 30th of this, of this month for the, uh, Warriors. Um, you know, anytime uh, myself, uh, a civilian, a celebrity, anybody can, you know, extend a hand and thank those people, man. It's a, it's a huge honor. It really is. And I want to thank you. I actually, um, I work with the Wounded Warrior Project as well. I know there's two different. There's Wounded Warrior Project and I think the Wounded Warrior Foundation. Um, but there's, there's, su- there's like a hundred of them, I think. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, the, but they're such a great organization because, I mean, a lot of times, you know, our, our military, they come back from active duty, and essentially our government kind of forgets about them, and it's important that we don't forget. And someone like you who's in the public eye, who has such an amazing following, especially amongst military, um, that's got to really feel good for you, too, to be giving back. Well, I mean, um, I, I, I'm so sorry to continue to repeat myself, but um, I always quote Barkley, and Barkley's a good buddy of mine, and I, and I love him to death. And it, it's just that he was, I, I, I think, uh, not misinformed. But, um, you know, he says that we're not role models. But the reality is, is one of the reasons why I wanted to be so successful as, a, as an athlete or as anything else is to have people look up to me and, and follow my footsteps and and try to lead themselves down the path that I'm leading myself and trying to do for my kid what I would do for everybody else. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, um, any time that you can give back, um, it's, it's, a, it's a gift. And as a celebrity, you have that gift because more than one or two people listen to what you have to say, and they revere you in one way, shape, or form, and therefore you have a following. And if you can teach your following 
to do right by the military, then you know that's 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 part of your duty. So um, I, I I do it with uh, with open arms, and I never pass up an opportunity to uh, stop and, and thank somebody for putting their life on the line for me being able to do the goofy things that I do every day. We're completely on board with that. It's funny you mentioned Barkley. I'm a Pennsylvanian. He was my hero growing up. I think part of the reason he went with the I'm not a role model, it was happening shortly after he threw that guy through the window, so I think maybe that was part of it. You know, I, his, his, his interpretation is we, sh- we as celebrities shouldn't be role models. The right. parents should be. Of course. But where, 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 that, where that fails is that, you know, that's a perfect world. This is by far um, the furthest thing from a perfect world as we see it imploding or exploding, quote unquote, around us right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I'd love for the parents to be able to set a right example, but they don't. And if the if a kid doesn't have a role model at home, then at least somebody who they revere in the sporting world and they look up to can set a positive example. You know, I mean, look at look at LeBron's decision to go back to Cleveland. Amazing. Um, you know, I I, I I can't say enough about that decision and my um, interpretation of the LeBron as a human being. I mean, the letter said it all, really. The letter was incredible. Yeah, I mean, I I met him. You know, he used to come, he used to come watch us wrestle. I think he brought his little brother or something like that. Um, it was right. It was embryonic stage of his career, you know. And he wasn't LeBron James. He was this fantastic kid who just got into the NBA, but he was far from the legend LeBron James. And he didn't really take to the public near as much as I wanted him to and near as much as he is now by any stretch of imagination. Right. But it's a learning process. And he was just a kid. And, you know, he, he, I'm, I'm so glad that through the years he's matured such that, I mean, this, this guy, everything he does is, is, is pretty much golden these days. And mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of his. And I, I can't say that I always was a huge fan. But, I mean, what he's done off the court makes me want to, get in his corner for everything he does on the court. So, well, You talk about being a role model. I mean, let's take wrestling out of it. Just the way you got to be a pro wrestler. I mean, people, th- you know, obviously you're a big dude, but if you look at your position and, and, you know, you played in college and then played in the NFL, you were really kind of undersized. Like, you had to do everything possible in your power in the gym, on the field, in practice, just to hang in. And, I mean, you're, you're playing with dudes like, you played with, like, Tuggle, right, who's like a monster. Thank you very much for pointing that out. I mean, it was a constant struggle for me uh, the entire time. I remember the only time that uh, I seemed to be able to put weight on is when I ate uh, three bacon double cheeseburgers every night before I went to bed. Yikes. You know, during two a days, um, it was a, it was a struggle. And I, I remember the day that I went up that Glanville. I was coaching Atlanta, and he comes up and he says, "You know, Goldberg, if I had a whole team full of you, that." You know, I, I'd be I'd be winning the Super Bowl, and man. the fact is, the reason why he said that is because prior to that, I had told him that, you know, though I may not have the most talent in the world, I, I guarantee you, I will be right by your side, broken leg and all. Um, I, I'll, I'll fight to the death, and and I've had to do that because of my lack of talent and or size throughout the years. I'd have it no other way. I mean, because it means that I appreciate everything that's given to me. Yeah. Or not just given to me, but that I earn. And, um, you know, hey, I used to train with Tuggle every day after two a days. And um, you talk about a freak of nature. I mean, we'd have a guy named Jumpy Gathers. Oh, yeah. I remember him. Yeah. Jumpy Gathers come in the weight room. And, you know, I, I told this story with Dion, but he'd come in the weight room in street clothes and smoking a cigar and out left me and Chesky <laughs> without even, you know. Without even trying, did so. even have elbow wraps on nothing. Just showed up in jeans. <laughs> elbow wraps. He didn't. He's never worn. He didn't even know what an elbow wrap is. He doesn't even know what wrist wraps. He doesn't know what straps are. He has no clue as to any jargon in the gym because he's done nothing in his entire life except for beat jumpy. Jumpy used to go up and down the offensive line, the starters, and beat each one of them one by one, and then he was done for the whole day. <sighs> Not a bad day's work. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to earn a living. I mean, talk about a specialist. Now, I know your time in Atlanta, you guys didn't win a lot of games, but you, 
and I imagine, you know, it starts at the top with Jerry Glanville being the leader. You guys were a hell of an entertaining team. What's one story that you remember from your Glanville days? Because for some reason, I remember the Falcons vividly, even though you guys kind of were like, what, 6 and 10, 7 and 9. But there was a lot of flash with you guys. We had Deion Sanders. We had uh, Andre Risen. We oh, had wow. um, Eric Pegram. I mean, we had, we had Jamal Anderson, Jesse Cogwell, Chris Dolman. I mean, the, the, you know, and we had Clay Matthews, not junior, senior, um, you know, in his 21st year, and Mike Cannon his 21st year, and Jamie Dukes. And, I mean, we had a, we had a, a Scott Case. We had a cornucopia of, of uh, characters, man. I mean, uh, it was, uh, it, it, it was a totally different time, you know, um, in the days when Bum Phillips and Jerry Glanville were head coaches of the NFL. Phew. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a really cool time. I mean, I wouldn't have changed anything for the world, but story wise, I mean, you know, we used to do fat Tuesdays on Wednesday and that was fat Tuesdays was a bar in Atlanta and that's where we would end, um, training camp and, you know, the stories that came out of fat Tuesdays on Wednesdays because when training camp would end on Wednesday. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, I won't go into detail as the stories, but I, I can just tell you that each one of them is uh, worthy of, of its entire podcast, I would imagine. So, um, yeah, it was crazy. Glanville was nuts. I mean, from him leaving tickets for Elvis every every game to, you know, him telling Scott Case to hit uh, James Brown as he broke through the line, you know, running with the ball with no pads on. So. <laughs> So he was that big of an Elvis guy that he thought that maybe he might just take a drive from Graceland. Well, he was dead, yeah. Um, well? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was, he, you know what, at the end of the day, he was a character. And I would have had no other way to play for a guy like that. I mean, he was no bullshit. I mean, he was straight to the point. Um, he wore his, his emotions on his sleeve. He was passionate about what he did. He was smart. And he was a defensive minded coach and I would have I would have killed for him. It was it was an awesome time. He was a bulldog. To this day I still remember some of his quotes from you know, that when they would mic him up. Uh, I think he had the this is the NFL which stands for not for long. I think that's Glanville. <laughs> exactly. He said that for the ref for the referee. <laughs> and then of course a couple F bombs came after that, but you know, that was the main quote. <laughs> He was great. He he really was awesome. I love the guy. And hey, not to mention he's a car guy. There's your segue into the, into the automobile stuff. He's a he's a freak when it comes to the speed. And he used to have this Thunderbird that I you know I I, I still to this day am afraid to ever step in the car with him again, let alone that Thunderbird that he had. But he loved to go fast. That's for sure. Yeah, on and off the field. I'm glad you uh, so you brought up the cars. I would like to do a segment uh, of the Goldberg Fast Five on our show. Would you mind if we asked you some five five questions? Sure, man. All right, let's do it. The Goldberg by, Fast by, Five. By, by the way, by the way, prior to this, I just got to tell you that uh, not to make you jealous or anything, but I just got back from Portland driving the Hellcat Challenger. Jesus, <laughs> it was kind of fun. Seven hundred and seven horsepower in the rain on on PRI Raceway. It was. Uh, it's. It was, Thought, were you afraid that you were going to wreck it? <laughs> I mean, absolutely. That's why. Uh, that's why I didn't go very fast. That's why my my video on my uh, replay camera uh, is is looks like a training video of, of a driver's at class because <laughs> I was going like slower up the track. I feel like on your life you should have a GoPro strapped to your forehead everywhere you go. Well, I was, you know, my replay was on this morning. I got it on the boat, on the uh, seal boat, the extraction boat, where we were, uh, I don't know, going 60 miles an hour, and then you just slam on the brakes. It's pretty sweet, man. You can go check it out on my YouTube channel. And Hey, man, I'll, I'll be talking about it on the podcast. I, like I said, I do some fun stuff, and I, I'm not bragging about it at all. I'm just trying to share it with people, and it's it's pretty cool. And, and the fun stuff I get to do, uh, I get to thank people at the same time. So it's it's really cool. Yeah, and you open your eyes, uh, you, you open people's eyes to opportunities they might want to work towards, or you know, fun things they could do for maybe a trip because you go all over the world. And so, um, and obviously, <laughs> you do talk about it in your podcast, which is pretty fun. First question here in the Goldberg Fast Five. Obviously, talking about cars, we know you're a car guy. 
What's the ride that you, that means the most to you? Uh, I know you have probably in excess of maybe 20 to 30 cars. Is there one that, that means the most, not necessarily in value, but just in, like, I'm a muscle car guy, but what is it that, that means the most to you? Well, I don't have anything that isn't muscle car. So okay. um, yeah, I think it's widely known as a car that I have. It's a 1970 Boss 429 Mustang. Jesus. It's called the Super Boss. It's uh, if you Google Super Boss, you can see this car. It's um, it is um, the it's one one of two um, automatic Boss 429s. Each 429 was built with a four speed. Mm-hmm. They built them in '69 and '70, and it was part of. Here's the time with the military again, but it was part of uh, the Ford Performance Driving Tour. The, the the uh, tie goes back to a uh, corporate lawyer for Chrysler. He developed this program to save servicemen because he didn't want them, to, uh, you know, buy these high horsepower cars and not knowing how to drive. So he went to Ford. They put this this tour together. It was campaigned over in Vietnam from '71 to '74, and the other car was crushed. And I've got the only one left. Good God, that's amazing. Uh, that definitely tops my next one. Uh, my dad is a '68 GTO convertible. He's had it for 30 years. That's not bad, though, right? That's bitching, man. I mean, it's all relative, dude. I mean, yeah. hey, yeah, one, you know, I, I got uh, multiple cars, but each one of them um, has a story, and it's uh, it, I don't have them just to, just to collect space in my garage. So anybody that has one to 50, it's the same kind of deal. They have a connection with a cool car. So nice. I don't want to make you jealous, uh, Bill, but I have a 2007 <laughs> Honda Fit, and it is red. <laughs> It's all good, man. Hobbits are cool. Man. You know, when my dad, when I was a kid, my dad went from Jaguars to Volvos to Hobbits, back to Jaguars. So he was a practical guy. Yeah, right. You know? So Hobbits are Hobbits a good deal, man, for sure. Who was your, who was your sports hero growing up? My brothers. You know, both my brothers played at the University of Minnesota. Like I said, one of my brothers was drafted out of high school to play baseball. Um, you know, he he forewent that opportunity to play football. He was with the Raiders, uh, the uh, Oakland Raiders, for about six months. And, um, you know, they were 14, 16 years older than me, and Jeez. I always looked up to them and wanted to be like them. So. Wow, that's a good answer. Uh, who was the funniest person off camera on the set of The Longest Yard? I'm going great, Kali, but what is your choice? <laughs> <laughs> no, Joey Diaz. Greg Khalid because, you know, he couldn't understand a friggin' word that he said that was yeah. hilarious just talking to him. But, um, you know, Nelly was funny. Uh, uh, Terry Crews is hilarious. You know, um, obviously Sadler's hilarious. Chris Rock's funny. But Joey Diaz, uh, you know, with his unadulterated uh, disregard for political correctness and humanity as a whole, yep. he's frickin' hilarious. I've done it's shows. Hilarious. I just had I just had him on the podcast. He, he's he's the best. I mean, he's the only he's the only guest I think in the world that I would ever be a, that I'm ever afraid to have on the show because right. he just doesn't care. No, Joey, I'm I'm a comic and I've done shows with him, and he's the kind of dude. Not only is he hilarious, but he he almost has to headline every show because there's no comic <laughs> that can really follow him. He's, he, whether it's his delivery, because Joey is Joey. 24 hours a day, he's that guy. Yep. He's just a funny guy. And, you know, I'm ecstatic that he's lost so much weight, and we're going to be able to see him for a longer period of time. So, Absolutely. He's a, he's a good dude. Who is your best friend from the wrestling business? Or maybe one or two. Best friend from the wrestling business? Uh, you know, uh, Scott or Rick Steiner. Okay. Um, you know, Henning was a great friend of mine. Um, DDP was a good friend. I, I'd say Steiner. Um, I rode with most. You know, Kevin Nash and I were good friends. Brock and I are good friends. But I think I spent the most time with Steiner, um, and he's he's of like mind, and uh, he's he's a good dude, man. He's a good dude. He and he and I, uh, 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 he and I alike are both uh, afraid of our wives. So I uh, have something in common. All right, lesson <laughs> learned for us on that one. And finally, question number five. You told a really funny story with Dion about how I, I think it was your final NFL game with the Falcons where I guess Dion was returning a punt towards the end of the game. He got late hit out of bounds, and you kind of attacked the dude that hit him late, and you got fined. Am I kind of accurate on that? Yeah, there was a – I think it was, it was an offensive guard, Ray, uh, Shields, something Shields, and I – I. Uh, I used to fight him all the time. I used to, I don't think there was an offensive line that I didn't try to fight, but, um, 
uh, you know, Dion and I were buddies, man, and Dion was Dion at the time, and he could do no wrong. He he was bringing the MC Hammer on the plane with us, you know, from, to the West Coast. He he, you know, he could do no wrong. He was the most unbelievable athlete, so he always took care of me, and uh, you know, so I was there to take care of him. I mean, he's hey man, Dion is going to tell you he 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 ain't no dude who's going to come up and deliver a blow on anybody. And so, uh, when it comes to physicality is concerned, I mean, he, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand by and watch him go up against many, many people. Right. I'd want to be there to help him, and he just totally got tattooed out of bounds, and you know, it cost me ten grand, which at the time was probably half of my salary for the entire year. <laughs> um, but and and to Dion, he made that in the first minute of, of nine on seven, you know, for the week, but. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I get flying ten grand, and it's all good. It's a good story, and I think I've got a lot of mileage out of it. Absolutely. Now, I know you're friends with Dion, but be honest, you had to pretend to like uh, "Must Be the Money," right? That song was rough. <laughs> no, man, I didn't like that at all. I mean, he <laughs> I, I, he he, uh, he knows that I'm an honest guy, and uh, that's what that's what friends are for. I blame that's Hammer. What friends are for. I blame Hammer for that song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How about the pants back in those days? I mean, you know, it was a totally goofy time. It was really strange. Oh, I wore, was, uh, I wore Zubaz. I remember. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's move. Uh, those weren't Zubas. Those had like those had like wires in them. I don't know what those. <laughs> oh man, a couple more questions, and uh, man, this has been fun. Um, okay, let, let's let's get into a couple minutes of wrestling. Um, what, WrestleMania twenty. That was such a polarizing reaction when you and Brock were in the ring. Did you, A, expect that kind of reaction, and B, do you look back on it now and just kind of laugh at how how people responded to, to both you in that match? Well, look at social media these days. You know, I mean, I, I said something about TNA closing their doors or something. Uh, was it today or yesterday on Twitter? And, um, you know, I, I get lambasted. You know, he, it's in 140 characters or less, or less, it's hard to be, it's hard to really be, you know, it's hard to show levity because um, people tend to jump on it all the time. And um, I I didn't expect, I mean, I, <laughs> back in the day, wrestling was a secretive world and you could, you could, you could, you could convince people whether they knew it or not that somehow, somehow, some way, shape, or form, that two guys really hated each other. They didn't ride together. They were never seen with each other. And so, for the most part, you can keep information away from people. So, to have so many people really know what the heck was going on, and to have that response that we did, I, I, in a million years, I couldn't have, I couldn't have, have uh, expected that. Um, and I'll look back on it and laugh at it. It's hard for me to find any levity in that, man. Um, you know, I, take me out of it, I, and I don't look at it as an insult to me. I mean, when I looked across the ring and saw Brock and his reaction, I mean, it was like not only was he infuriated and it looked like I had a, a, a red cape and he was a charging bull coming at me, <laughs> but um, you know, it was it was disgust, it was it was hurt. Um, you know, neither one of us expected it, and and I mean, it wasn't our fault that we that he wanted to pursue a dream of his and it wasn't my fault that you know the wwe and i didn't see eye to eye by any stretch of the imagination and that was a tumultuous year of my life the reason why i went to the wwe was for the fans mm -hmm. you know but i'm not going to sacrifice days of my life for other people because you know i've got two wonderful people in my life my immediate family my wife uh and my little eight-year-old boy that deserve you know as many days as they get right and, um, you know, we, 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 it was sad to see him and his react. I mean, whatever. I mean, Brock's a, this big badass dude. And, you know, does he have feelings? Well, yeah, everybody's got feelings. Um, I, uh, uh, so I don't find any levity in it looking back on it and, and saying, you know what, how stupid the wrestling fans are. Hey, if they didn't, they didn't deserve to get what they got. Well, actually, yeah, they didn't. The, you know, the the buildup wasn't there. Obviously, everybody knew. There's so much they could go. This is a whole podcast in and of itself. Right. Um, they there was so much that they could have gone into it to crescendo to one of the gnarliest feuds ever in the history of, of wrestling. I believe. 
you know, we you would have had two bulls crescendo, you know, to an, an ultimate effect and show or or final final uh, show uh, uh, showdown. Um, whether it be WrestleMania, whether it be you know the next WrestleMania after that one, after that you know whatever it is, man, it just they didn't do it any justice. They didn't set us up at all. Right. Um, and you know it, it it sucked. It was hard to go through it. Um, but at the same time, um, you know I, I I don't think I don't think we deserve that. You know. Um, but it was but I, the fans didn't deserve it either. They deserved an explanation. But at the end of the day, you know, being being um, honest sometimes doesn't get you the reaction that you really want. And um, people are, are quite selfish at times, and they want, you know, their wrestling. And if you're not in tune with it, look at CM Punk. He wanted to go out and do his own thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people take offense to it. But, hey, man, it's, uh, it's our lives, first and foremost. Yeah. And, um, you know... Well, we're with you. Can't please everybody. We're a podcast that always goes to the side of the pro wrestler. So, absolutely. I mean, and you're a level headed guy, and obviously, you you were very level headed about the situation. So, I appreciate the answer on that. Now, you you recently uh, debuted a wrestling call in segment on Who's Next for the first time. Do do you enjoy walking down wrestling memory lane, or, or are you happy to put some distance on it for the most part? I'm both, man. I mean, I had some. You know, people get the wrong impression when I talk negatively about the business. When I talk negatively about the business, you know, I talk about the, the products of the business that were negative. Um, you know, there there are in every endeavor there are things that are not uh, uh, as as beautiful as smelling a rose, and you're going to come up with roadblocks. And you know, there were people and there were situations that I dealt with that were very unprofessional and very childlike and very uh, uh, fraternity like that I didn't think had any place in a business that was predicated upon making as much money as humanly possible. And I don't know a, a business like human being that can argue that point. And so when other things uh, factor into it, you know, they reflect negatively on the business. If you're a level-headed person, like you just said, I was. So I like to think of, that I am. And I come from a background, or, you know, my father's a physician, you know, went to Harvard, and my mom was a, a violinist at the Chicago Philharmonic, and she's a United States Orchid judge. So I'm not, I, I haven't been, you know, I, I've been I've been lucky enough. My brothers are very successful. My sister's successful. They've been able to provide me with wonderful experiences that have taught me valuable lessons throughout my life. And dealing with some of the crap that I dealt with was like dealing with, Barnum and Bentley Circus, <laughs> and um, you know, I mean, let's let's get real, dude. I mean, you know, we're 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 men and women here, and so um, I just I chose not to deal with it. And um, you know, I, like I said, I made the decision. I sat out from WCW. I wasn't going to take fifty cents on the dollar. Um, I was going to get my entire contract because that's what I deserve, and that's what I fought for. And my decision to go back was totally predicated upon. Uh, trying to put a smile on the kids' faces that we're fans about. Absolutely. And and people forget, you know, professional wrestling, yes, it's sports entertainment. Yes, it's spectacular to watch. It's it's just like any other profession. Everyone goes to work, and some days you've got to deal with assholes. Other days you have a bad day. There's going to be stuff you complain about with every job. And I think a lot of times people forget, you know, when they're listening, maybe. Yeah, they think celebrities' lives are immune to, to conflict and immune to dealing with you know, the, the, the rigors and the struggles of everyday life. It's, it's, it's not that rosy. It's really not. Um, and that's why people get exploited so much when they step on the wrong side of the law. They do uh, negative things, and you know, because how dare they? You know, how dare they deal with things that normal people deal with? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange dichotomy, the celebrity thing. But it's, like I said, man, it's, uh, there's, there's, there's bad the ability to set a good example for the next generation the coolest thing that comes with that's a I, I was always curious for i mean one of the things that kind of got you to that celebrity sage was your your streak uh for 100 and, well, i think it was 173 w's that you got did in the middle of that did you did you realize you know i guess when did you realize it was going to be such a serious streak was it the plan the whole time or was it something that kind of slowly built uh with the creative team I think it was all all organic. I think Mike Tanay had a lot to do with it. Um, I think he came up with it, and Bobby Heenan had a lot to do with it. 
and I, I, I there was never a plan to do it from the from the beginning by any stretch. I don't know at what point they wanted to care. They, they just wrote it out until there was there was wasn't a lot of creative with it. You know, it wasn't, <laughs> it, wasn't, it, wasn't it wasn't this thing that they sat in the back and said, "Okay, we get we're going to pick this guy out and um, forget about his reaction. We're going to point it in this direction and we're going to make sure he's he's going to win 173 matches." And this is how he's going to do it. No, man, it was organic. Um, I think Hogan had a lot to do with it. I, I, I JJ Dillon. I, I really don't know who was instrumental in it. I know today had a lot to do with it. But um, it was just something that was bred by the sheer reaction of the fans. I think um, it came at a time of you know the, the the beginning stage of mixed martial arts to be you know one of the biggest sports around. And, um, I, I just think it was different. It was fresh. It, it, it crossed the line of reality and, and fictitious, um, you know, role playing stuff. And I just think it gave him something different. And it was, it was cool. It really did. And uh, that's a great way to end. We can't thank you enough. This interview was a lot of fun, man. Um, once again, guys, goes uh, podcast one. Who's next? Every single week. And um, anything else we could uh, we could mention? No, man, you know, uh, just like I said, um, anybody and everybody who's listening to this, um, anytime you see somebody in a uniform, yes, go up and shake their hand and thank them for the time that they're putting in to protect your ass that's walking around laughing and joking and drinking beer all the time. And podcasting. Um, you know, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty gnarly deal. It's a pretty gnarly deal what these kids go through to, uh, to fight for our freedom. Um, that's it, man. And everybody uh, better get their ass over to Podcast One and Who's Next with Goldberg. New new episode debuts every Friday. Um, um, Darius Rucker will be on next week, but this week we got a very special one, you know, NASCAR legend. But everybody's a hero, Dale Earnhardt Jr. And wow. um, Hendrick Motorsports will be well represented. You know, they're good friends of mine. And, you know, hopefully I can get them on the phone for as long as humanly possible. So that's it, guys. I appreciate it very much, man. Uh, it was a uh, a good talk, and, and thanks for not bombarding me with wrestling questions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My pleasure, and, and that's an eclectic group of guests you have coming up. So congratulations on who's next. Um, it's it's a really it's, it's so fun to listen to, and uh, and hopefully we'll you know as, as Steve Austin would say, I guess we'll we'll catch you on down the road, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll do it again. It'd be a pleasure. It's been real, guys. Uh, good luck with what you guys are doing. And uh, anytime I can uh, help you out with what you're doing and cross promote, man, it's my pleasure. So. Of course, I'm, I might just show up at Podcast One Studios one day and just. <laughs> it's all good, man. You can you can help me. Uh, you can help me get uh, more in tune with the ability to sit behind a uh, a glass cage and and present to people. Hey, it's, sounds... uh, it's different. That's a that's a trade. We got it. <laughs> Okay, Jeff. Y'all be good. All right. Take care, man. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, man. All right, guys. That's a wrap. Mick Foley, Booker T, Goldberg, are you serious? Packed tighter than a can of sardines, Johnny. That's right. A can of fish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were all just good. exceptional. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, that's like a dream I had once where Mick Foley, Booker T, and Goldberg are talking to me. And then that's following up two weeks ago, CM Punk. Last week, Hulk Hogan and Daniel Bryan. I don't know... This is like, why does not everyone on earth listen to this show? Pinch me, Johnny. No, but but you're not. You're. How doing, do I know? But, but, but Chuck. But I, I no. <laughs> <laughs> what a maneuver! So, guys, thank you so much. Please tell eleven of your friends or thirteen to follow us to subscribe us at Wrestling Buds. Subscribe on iTunes. Please rate us five stars. Please review the show. Because I'll be honest with you, we put a lot of our lives into this show, and we do it all for you because we love the business, and we know you do too, and we love our compadres, man. Yeah, so if you, again, are at SummerSlam, come up and find us. We'll be at those panels on Saturday, the confidential panels. I believe they're, they're one Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but we're only going to the Saturday ones. Or find us at SummerSlam. If any of y'all are going to be at WWE screening of Leprechaun on Wednesday night in Los Angeles, I will be there for that. So. There you go. Hard to miss this. Come find it. Boom. Chuck, put yourself over. You can find me on Twitter at CRice17. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of y'all out there this weekend. No doubt. Dale Rutledge. I am The Walking Dale on Instagram and Twitter. And you can always find me cooking up some recipes on www.youtube.com slash dishingonmovies. With a hot pepper in his mouth. <laughs> oh, not again, my friend. <laughs> not again. 
at Jay Quasto. And also, guys, go to thethumbwrestler.com. You can ch- check out the trailer for my film that hopefully will be coming out sometime soon. Shout out to Nerdist, our engineers, Katie Levine and Monica Shaw, the man behind the music, Jake Lloyd at Liquid Jake, every one of you in the Slamcast stratosphere. Thank you to Goldberg, Mick Foley, Booker T, and most importantly, thank every single one of you. We love you. Please continue to be interactive with us. Enjoy the heck out of this SummerSlam weekend because we're about to also see you next week. Now leaving Nerdist.com.